<clears throat> Good morning. Um, those who were not here last week, we talked about last week on, oh, the kids can be dismissed for jam. I'm sorry. Sorry. Um, those, who were not, th those who were not here, or if you were here, uh, last week you probably will remember that we talked about finding peace in times of chaos. We talked about James and how James saw it. He called a spade a spade. He, he called us to say, hey, wh what causes chaos among you? He said it comes from inside you. It's the way we think about things and how we can resolve it. We talked about we, resolve, we can resolve it by submitting ourselves to God, by staying away from the worldliness. And finally, if you want peace, leave it up to God and let him be the judge. Easier said than done, right? Leaving up to God, because, you know, Romans 12, 1 say, offer your body as a living sacrifice. You know the problem with living sacrifice, submitting everything to God? You know, whenever the altar, the heat is turned on, you're like, oh, it's hot. <laughs> I'm going to take things in my own hand. And I have done this, right? And that creates its own problem, right? That creates us making mistakes, right? That creates us making the things that we shouldn't have done, right? That creates a different kind of chaos. The first time I saw him, I remember when he walked into my restaurant, right? He greeted me like an old friend would greet you, right? Never met this guy before. And he comes in and he sits down and we are drinking coffee and, and he wanted to know how I was doing. It's kind of strange, right? You meet somebody for the first time and you ask them how they are doing. It's commonly a uh, you know, like a social thing, right? How are you doing? What's your general answer? Oh, I'm doing fine, right? That's what we say. Well, I say the same thing, but he really wanted to talk about deeper things, weird things, right? Like how are you? He was not interested in the future, you know, what I was going to do. He was more interested in my past, right? I was not interested in telling anybody about my past. My past is personal, right? At least at that point of time, my past was very personal to me, right? The things which I've done, the things I was probably not very proud, the things I was flat out ashamed of, the mistakes I've made in my life, right? The shame and the worries of my past and how I knew it's shaping my today for the future. And that's what he wanted to know. So I covered it up, you know, in a formal, you know, just covered it up with some lies, with some deceit. And especially, I'm good in covering up my past with my future success. Like, look, the shiny things. I looked up to him, you know, he wanted to mentor me, he wanted to disciple me. But he knew that for me to move forward, he needed to set up foundation and dig up deeper into me. But I was scared he was going to come across a lot of landmines, a lot of stuff which I've done in the past, which is, which was, I thought it was nicely buried, totally sealed, not to look at. At this point of time, I wished I could go back in time and hit an undo button to the regrets of my life. Am I alone here? There are some of us who would say, you know, if there was an undo button to some of the decisions which we have made in my life, I'm sure a lot of us will run to it and try to hit it. And I'm not talking about the ones which we make unknowingly right? We bought a house here in Delhi, and I've never bought a house before, and I have a nice little lawn in the front, and there was, 
the past owner didn't take really good care, so there were a lot of weeds in the front yard. And I was a zealous first time homeowner, so I was gonna get rid of all the weed, right? So one morning I was you know, out there with my weed killer and I was just going at it, right? I was just, I, I was gonna get it done today. So I sprayed it all, and I was very proud of it, the work I done, you know, because I came in. And you know, have you ever sprayed ever weed killer on your garden? Some of you have. What do you do? What's the sec next thing you do? <laughs> you wash your hands, and then you go and look, right? You go look. You're like, what's happening? For the first time, you look. You're like, okay, is it, what's happening? I was very proud, because I could see the, the weed wilting, you know, so I was like, okay, it's working, yes. But then I also saw the grass wilting around it. And I'm like, okay, probably not that bad. Lorna, do you remember that? She's laughing behind there. Yeah, so I'm like, what's wrong? So I go in there and I look and I'm like, yep, the weed's wilting, the grass is wilting as well. Run to my garage and to my utter surprise, I've used the grass and weed killer instead of just the weed killer. I so wish at that point of time I could go back in time and just hit undo, you know? Don't grab this. And they all look the same, right? They all look exactly the same. Not the same. My life before Christ was exactly like that. Filled with a lot of regrets. This regret, today if you come to our yard, you probably won't see those marks in the grass, but some regrets are deep inside our heart, which I wish we could go and undo some of that. Anyone here feels any regrets of those kind, you know, to tell a person maybe that we love them and we didn't say it enough? And now they're gone. So anybody feels regret about staying in a toxic relationship a little bit too long? Maybe they should have left. Maybe we should have left. Any regrets of spending a little bit too much time at work when you should have been at home watching your kids grow up or helping out? Any regrets? Any, what about those regrets when we tell a lie, right? And we know it's not a real lie, but it's just fabrication. Maybe it's just borderline. Maybe it's just not telling the truth, right? Like just. And the Holy Spirit points you and you go, oh, shouldn't have done that. I know I have regrets, and these regrets bring anxiety, right? It's like a knot in your stomach. Have you ever had that knot in your stomach when it reminds you? When you, remind, when the, when you, when you remember it and it's just a knot? It's just me? Is there anybody else? Like you have a knot in your stomach. You're like, oh, wish you could go back and just redo, undo the, I wish I could just go back. So is there a remedy for regrets, right? Is there a remedy? Is there an undo button, right? Is there a time when I will get rid of this knot from my belly? Is there a time when I can be free from this pain and the shame of regret? Is there, is there a time? Is there a, something that I can do? Is there a future when I can finally get past of my past? Is there a remedy for regrets? Well, the answer is, it depends. It depends. We're teaching our kids, you know, to forgive each other and, you know, but there is always consequences of the decisions we have made in the past. There's always two options. And depending upon which path you take, there could be freedom or there could be bondage. If you're gonna look at the Bible today, generally I don't use PowerPoints, but we're gonna rapid fire through a lot of verses, so I won't let you shuffle through your Bible. So we'll have it on the screen here. 
So we're going to look at two people with huge regrets in the Bible and how they dealt with it, right? Because that's where I think we can see the remedy for regrets. So we are going to look at Mark 14, right? Just to give you an idea, before we get there, before we get to the verses, um, Jesus already has told his disciples three times that he's going to die, right? That's not a really comfortable conversation to have. Like, are you sick? Something's wrong with you? Something's going to come and get you? Are you just paranoid? Those are the things come to my mind if somebody tells me that they are going to die. More than one time, right? So you lose confidence in the person if they say they are not feeling well. So the disciples are hungry. I get hangry, right? And I know somebody who gets, why are you laughing? <laughs> just look back. I know somebody who just gets airheaded when they are hungry. Those are the two spectrum. And when they collide together, it's not a good sin. But the disciples are hungry and they are preparing for this big party, right? And this is what they ask. Jesus, where should we go and eat our Passover meal? Right? It's like, you know, when I ask my wife, hey, guests are coming tomorrow. What should I go and buy? She gives me a list. Right? Right? But if she told me this, this is what Jesus says to the disciple. Go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. What? What? That's like Karen telling David, honey, just go buy whatever you want for the party tomorrow. That will never happen. I know David and Karen. That will never happen, right? No. That will never happen. Lorna will never say that to me. But this is what Jesus says. And that's what happened, right? That's what happened. There was a man carrying a jar of water, and he said, hey, come to the upper room. There is, there is a feast ready. And but that doesn't build confidence in the disciples. So they are eating their meal. You know, they're in the upper room. They, they got all settled. They're all reclining by the table. And, and this, I think, in recorded history is the worst dinner conversation ever. Right? The next verse. The worst. This is the next conversation here. They were all reclining by the table, and he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who's eating with me. Can you imagine? Just imagine this. Jesus came over for dinner, and you have prepared this great meal. We are all eating. It's all good and hunky-dory. And Jesus said, You know, Ahmed, one of you. I'm like, there's only four of us. Like, who's that one? Right? One of you is going to betray me. You know, we know now what... What was that betrayal, right? We know now. We have read the Bible. We, we know what the betrayal is. But think about this. Those 12 disciples had no idea what betrayal looked like, right? They had no concept of what was going to happen. But Jesus knew what was going to happen. And Jesus said that to all the 12 disciples, right? Would you feel sad if Jesus said that to you? That knowingly, that you, you are going to betray me. Guess what they said? Oops. They were all sad. And they said, surely not me. And that's when you look back at your wife. You're like, honey. <laughs> right? Surely not me. I wish Jesus had a different answer at this point of time. Right? Because Jesus knew what has already happened, right? Judas had already, has already betrayed Jesus. Judas has already gone to the Pharisees and sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Jesus already knew this. You know, it's easy to blame Judas, right? 
But Judas was a zealot, right? He was a go-getter, right? He was a self-doer, self-motivator. In our words, he was an entrepreneur, right? In our world, Judas will be considered an entrepreneur. Can you imagine an entrepreneur has heard that the CEO is talking about dying, leaving, he's, you know, he's humbling himself? Like, think about this. An entrepreneur who's a go-getter is looking at Jesus, the CEO of this movement, the one who is going to be the king of kings, right? He's going to get rid of the Romans. He is kneeling down and washing the feet of the disciples, right? It's weird in our world, right? It was definitely weird in their world. The servant may wash the master's feet, but a teacher, a teacher who's doing all these miracles, is washing the feet of the disciples. Jesus thought, let me help him out here. Let me just, let me just give it a little push. Let me just give this kingdom movement a little push, a little Now, everybody else in that group was happy about this. So kind of they, you know, Judas left. Everybody's like, now at least we now know who the deadbeat was. He's gone now, right? At least I'm good, right? I'm good, Jesus, right? How many of you know, shout out, who do you think betrayed Jesus? Shout out. Judas, right? Judas was the betrayer. So everybody is like, okay, I'm in the green. And then Jesus drops this bomb. This is what he says. You will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Right? He's quoting from Zechariah. You will all fall away. I will strike the sheep and you will all be scattered. These are 12 grown men, right? Can you imagine? If somebody came to take Jesus away, these, what do you think will happen naturally or normally? They will fight, right? And Peter, the sparky one, he says, whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on a second, Jesus. Hold on a second. I will go to the end with you. Right? Before we get there, put a pin in here in this one, what Jesus says. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Put a pin in there. We are going to come back to that. Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. Right? And Jesus said, truly I tell you today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. That is a sad time for Peter. Right? Tonight. Tonight. Guys, you can make a mistake. You know something we learned here or something, we, something my wife told me, I can make a mistake. You know, few weeks, few days, few months down the road. But Jesus is telling Peter, Peter, listen, 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 listen. Something really bad is going to happen. And you are going to betray me tonight. Ikes. You know how strong-minded Peter was, right? In his dealings, and Jesus is telling him straight up, you are going to betray me tonight. But we know what happened, right? For us to look back in that story, we know what happened, right? What happened? Peter denied Jesus three times. He not only denied this is where, you know, we have, we have heard these things so many times, right? You have coming to church, you have heard these things so many times. You're like, okay, the betrayer guy was Judas, bad guy, not want to be friends with him. He's gone, good riddance, right? But Peter, this is what Peter said about when he was asked about Jesus. When Peter was asked about Jesus the last time, he began to call down curses, and he swore to them. Peter just didn't say, I didn't know him, right? Peter literally started throwing curses at them, swearing at them, right? And he said what? I don't know this man you're talking about. Can you imagine, we just sang what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus, the powerful name 
of Jesus. And after that song was over, I'll tell you, you, just tonight, you will deny Jesus Christ. And this is what, Je this is what Peter did. And immediately, the rooster crowed the second time. You know, some of the, some of the older manuscript doesn't mention the second time, right? It was added in later. But the significance of it is, it's just a reminder of what Jesus told him, what will happen. And it did happen. How many of you think Peter would have been totally comfortable if this was left out of the gospel? Right? Like, don't dare my dirty laundry here, man. Like, there was not many people here, guys, if you see. Right? There were not many disciples around Peter. Doesn't say that, right? So this is Peter's own testimony. This is Peter's own testimony telling us how he messed up. Hmm. And what he did? He broke down and wept. Do you think there was some sorrow there? Do you think there were some regrets there? Do you think? But you know, Peter was not the only one who was in that regret business. Judas was also in the regret zone at this point of time. See what, did, what Judas did. When Jesus, Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and the elders. We have read this so many times during Christmas, during Easter, during all this time. We kind of skip through it. We are like, yeah, 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 here, you return. That's a big deal. But what is Judas trying to do here, guys? What do you think he's trying to do? He's trying to make restitution. He's like, I don't want this money. He tried to return. He's like, oh my goodness, I made a mistake. What is Judas trying to do here? He's trying to hit the undo button, right? He's like, let me hit the undo button. Let me just fix this. That's what I did, right? After I sprayed weed killer, grass and weed killer, what did I do? I took my hose out. Man, I just hosed the whole thing down. Unfortunately, it just spread the weed killer more. <laughs> I took things into my own hands. I'm like, I'm going to fix it. That's what Judas is doing here. I'm going to fix this mistake. So I don't have to live my life with regret. Judas doesn't stop there. Judas goes one step forward. Judas tries to make restitution. Also, he confesses his sin. He is following the steps of how to avoid regrets in your life. He goes and confesses his sin. Judas says, I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. Unfortunately, that's where Judas stops. That's where Judas stops. Both Peter and Judas Two people, both displayed remorse, but one stopped there and took matter into his own hands. I want you to just pause here for a second, right? And this is the, this is the turning point in the story. I want you to pause here for a second. I'm going to tell you about in my life. There are some mistakes which I've made in my life. I take things into my own hands. Because at that point of time, I think, you know, this mistake is too big for God to forgive. This mistake is too big for me to even tell my wife. This mistake is too big for me to even ask. I'm never going to be forgiven for this mistake. This is too big. I've killed the Son of Man. Judas is saying, I have said that in my life too. What I have done is who I am, and who I am is who I will become. And the devil uses that regret and that shame and that 
pain and that regret in you to turn you away from God. And when the thoughts take hold of us, right, it turns into shackles. Judas felt remorse. He returned the money. He confessed his sins, but he stopped. Judas had an option. I looked online and I couldn't find it because that was my wishful thinking. But can you imagine if Judas, who has heard Jesus, right? He has seen Jesus turning water into wine. He has seen Jesus feeding thousands. He has seen Jesus saying, forgive the people who has caused harm against you. Forgive your debtors. Forgive those trespasses. Forgive those. Jesus even went further. Jesus said, pray. Pray for your enemies. Can you just imagine Judas after saying, confessing his sins, turned around and went back to Jesus on the cross and said, Jesus, I messed up, man. Really, I'm sorry. What do you think Jesus would have said there? What do you think? Church, what do you think Jesus would have said there? There is no picture online because Judas did not take that path. But guess who took that path? Peter. Peter humbled himself. Peter knew that he has made a colossal mistake. And no matter what he does, nothing is going to fix what he has done. He is living the life of regret. He is living the life of remorse. Do you remember what Jesus said when Peter said, I'll follow you to the end of the world? Do you remember what Jesus said? No, 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 wait. I will die, then I'll go back to Galilee, but then Jesus before going to heaven, Jesus before going to heaven had one more job to do. Do you remember that? I love this picture. Jesus sat by the Sea of Galilee. And he said, Peter, you had a rough couple days, buddy. You had a rough couple days. And Peter was struggling to fish that night. I'm sure he had tears. He has denied his master. And nobody, at this point of time, nobody knows about it. Right. He is struggling inside. He has full of regrets. Guess what Jesus says? Come over, buddy. Come over. You're going to have some breakfast. I'm making some breakfast. Come on over. The guy who you denied, who you, you swear that you don't know him. He's saying, come on over, man. Can you imagine? Jesus said, come over. Come over. We're going to have something to eat. What did Jesus say to him? Do you remember the next conversation Jesus had? Jesus and his questions, man, it's like hits me all the time, you know. He said, Peter, 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 do you love me? Do you love me? What did Jesus say? Oh, Peter says, yes, of course I love you. Of course, of course I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. You know, Jesus doesn't stop there. Jesus says, what? Peter, Peter, do you re really love me? Peter said, yes, of course I love you. I'm eating breakfast with you. Come on, we're friends, we're buddies. Remember all this time? Jesus said, feed my lamb. But Jesus didn't stop there. Jesus asked Peter one more time. Doesn't say Peter. This is what he says. Simon, son of John, do you really love me? The third time, 
Peter said, Jesus, you know all things. You know that I love you. How many times did Peter deny Jesus? Three times. How many times did Jesus ask Peter, do you love me? Do you know what Jesus was doing? He was restoring Peter back so he doesn't live his life with regret. Before Jesus ascended to heaven, he had one last thing to do. He had to talk to Peter to say, dude, you don't have to live your life in regret, in pain and in shackles of the mistakes that you have made, even denying the Son of Man. I know you probably have made a lot of mistakes. I definitely have made a lot of mistakes in my life. But friends, brothers and sisters, you will never make a mistake of denying Jesus to others when you have lived with him for many years. Even that, Jesus was able to turn around. Two roads. Two roads. One is take things in your own hand and figure out how am I going to get rid of this regret. Second, Go for breakfast with Jesus. Just let him do the work. He wants it. He needs it. That's why he came here to do it. Paul says it better. Paul says, Godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation. Godly grief produces repentance. Turn around. Take the road, what Peter took, that leads to salvation without? Church, that was your moment. <laughs> you missed it. Let's try it again. Godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without? Regret. Is there a remedy for regret? Whereas worldly grief produces death. Didn't we just see that in the story here? That worldly grief produces, if you want to take things into your own hand and run with it, it will produce death. But you know, is that the end of the story? I don't think so. I don't think so. Because Peter doesn't stay there, right? Peter doesn't stay by the Galilee. Guess what Peter does after Jesus is raised and he's gone to heaven? Guess what Peter does the next thing? He goes back to Jerusalem, right? And he is back on the steps of the temple and he is telling people. What is he telling? He's saying, listen, you, you have killed the Son of Man and repent. And Luke registers in Acts that 3,000 people came to Lord that day. 3,000 people came to Lord that day. You know, scholars think that Jerusalem had about 30,000 people living in there. 10% of the population came to the Lord that day. Jesus can use our brokenness, right? Is there a remedy for regret? It depends. It depends. Do we have a godly grief that we move towards Jesus? Or do we have a way to hide our regret, hide our shame, keep it inside us, and let it fester us, and hold us, grip us, and leave a life of bondage. I want you to hear this song which Lorna is going to play. There is a reason why God brings these things in our life, right? There's a reason. We, it may not be evident directly why those things are coming into our life, but God is preparing us for the plans He 
has for our life. And I have three points to make what those are after you listen to the song. I wish it was that easy, right? Just give it to God. He will take care of it. You say, Amit, great, great message. Fantastic. I want to give you three practical things what we need to do after that, right? The regrets don't go away that easily, right? We have a tendency to bring it back in our life, okay? First, accept God's forgiveness. Accept God did for you, right? Romans 8, 1 says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Embrace the freedom that comes with God's forgiveness. you got to go closer and closer towards it. Second, learn and grow from it. Philippians 3, 13 and 14 say, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, do not let the devil 
dance on your head, reminding you the mistakes that you made in life. If you have given it to Jesus, it is over. It is finished. It is done. Forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Turning regrets into lesson for personal growth. My life was not perfect in the past. And there is no guarantee that my life will be perfect in the future. But I guarantee, I can only guarantee that I will live and move towards Christ every step of the way. You want a remedy for living life without regrets. Move towards God no matter what decision you make in your life. And finally... The most favorite thing, always remember, God is a sovereign God. He doesn't make a mistake. He didn't forget about you when you made the mistake. He did not turn his head away when you asked for forgiveness. He is listening. He is moving closer to you as you are moving closer to him. The best thing my kids do when they make a mistake, when they run towards me and say, I'm sorry I messed up. You know, that is the most thrilling, and you guys have been parents. You know that is the most beautiful time. Do it for yourself. Take your mistakes, take your regret, pack it in a bag, run towards Jesus, leave it there. And we know that in all things, so let's read it together. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. You want to be used by God? Run closer towards him. I know, friends, there will be regrets in life. And I had regrets in life. And you know the man I talked about who came in sat in my restaurant and talked to me. His name is Dennis McCoy. He was a pastor of a church just a couple blocks away from my restaurant. And while he was talking to me and digging up all these regrets and all these past from my life, there were a group of ladies. We used to call them hat ladies because they had their all fancy Caribbean hat. They would fast and pray for me that I will leave my regrets and my shame behind and give my life to Christ. Pastor McCoy, he has been my godfather. He, was, he, is, he has been an integral part of my life. And he was a witness of seeing me baptizing my mom and my dad one decision that you make, whether you're going to give the regrets to God or take things in your own hand, will dictate whether there will be a remedy for the regrets. Let me pray with you. Dear Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that you gave us in your entire mercy you gave us this story of Judas and Peter to show us how to live our life with past regrets and how to move forward help us dear Lord all of us including me me first dear Lord when we make a mistake, we bring it to your altar and we leave it there. Father, turn away from the worldliness and go closer towards you because you are holy. You are pure. And as it is written in the Bible, 
things which touches your altar turns holy. So Father, take my broken heart, take these scars, and turn it holy for your kingdom building. Heal our hearts, dear Lord. Let not we rebuke the enemy today as a body of church, as the body of Christ. We rebuke the enemy today who uses these regrets, these past mistakes to confuse us, to take us away from Jesus. Dear Lord, we rebuke the enemy today in the name of Jesus that it will take those shackles away from the hearts and the minds of the people that is bounded and defined by the mistake. Father, when people see us, help them to see the sacrifice of Jesus. Bring peace to our hearts. As we are going to sing, Shalom to you now. Shalom, my friend. Bring that shalom. Bring that peace. Bring that godly peace inside our heart. Put some of your ointment of peace on the sorrows of our regrets. We pray this in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. Amen.